Hey, it's Officer Dan. Today I'll be reading to you. All night, Ruby moans and sniffles. I pace my domain. I don't want to fall asleep in case she needs something. Ivan, Bob says gently, get some sleep, please, for your sake and for mine. Bob can't sleep unless he is on my stomach. I hear a stirring. Ivan, Ruby calls. I rush to my window. Ruby, are you all right? I miss Aunt Stella, Ruby sobs. And I miss my mom and my sisters and my aunts and my cousins too. I know, I say, because it's all I can think of. Ruby sniffles. I can't sleep. Do you know any stories? The way Aunt Stella did? Not really, I admit. Stories were Stella's specialty. Tell me a story about when you were little, Ruby pleads. She puts her trunk between the bars. Please, Ivan. I scratch the back of my head. I don't remember things, Ruby, I admit. It's true, Bob says, trying to be helpful. Ivan has a terrible memory. He's the opposite of an elephant. Ruby lets out a long, shivery breath. Oh well, that's okay. Night, Ivan and Bob. I listen to Ruby's soft sighs, soft sobs for long, horrible minutes. Then I hear myself saying, Once upon a time, there was a gorilla named Ivan. And slowly and deliberately, I try to remember. I was born in a place humans call Central Africa, in a dense rainforest so beautiful no crayons could ever do it justice. Gorillas don't name their newborns right away, the way humans do. We get to know our babies first. We wait to see hints of what yet be. When they saw how much she loved to chase me around the forest, my parents decided on my twin sister's name, Tag. Oh. How I loved to play tag with my sister. She was nimble, but when I got too close, she would leap onto my unsuspecting father. Then I would join her, and we would bounce on that tolerant belly until he gave us the grunt, the rooting pig sound that meant enough. The game never got old, although my father might have disagreed. It didn't take long for my parents to find my name. All day long, every day, I made pictures. I drew on rocks and bark and my poor mother's back. I used the sap of leaves. I used the juice from fruit. But mostly, I used mud. And that is what they called me, mud. To a human, mud might sound like much, might not sound like much. But to me, it was everything. My family, which humans call a troop, was just like any other gorilla family. There were 10 of us, my father, the silverback, my mother, and three other adult females, a juvenile male called a blackback, and two other young gorillas. Tag and I were the babies of the group. We squabbled now and then, as families do, but my father knew how to keep us in line with a simple scowl. And for the most part, we were happy to do what we were meant to do to feed and forage and nap and play. My father was a master at leading us to the ripest fruit for our morning feast and the finest branches for our night nests. He was everything a silverback is meant to be, a guide, a teacher, a protector. And nobody could chest beat like my father. Gorilla babies and elephant babies and human babies are not so different, except that gorillas that except that a gorilla gets to spend the day riding on his mother's back, like a cowboy on a horse. It's a pretty great system, from the baby's point of view. Slowly, carefully, a young gorilla begins to venture farther and farther away from the safety of his mother's arms. He learns the skills he will need as an adult, how to make a nest of branches, weave them tightly, or they will fall apart in the middle of the night, how to beat your chest, cup your palms and amplify the sound. How to go vining from tree to tree, don't let go. How to be kind, be strong, be loyal. Growing up, gorilla is just like any other kind of growing up. You make mistakes, you play, you learn, you do it all over again. It was, for a while, a perfect life. One day, a still day when the hot air hummed, the humans came. After they captured my sister and me, they put us in a cramped, dark crate that smelled of urine and fear. Somehow, I knew that in order to live, 
I had to let my old life die. But my sister could not let go of our home. It held her like a vine, stretching across the miles, comforting, strangling. We were still in our crate when she looked at me without seeing, and I knew that the vine had finally snapped. It was Mac who pried open that crate, Mac who bought me, and Mac who raised me like a human baby. I wore diapers. I drank from a bottle. I slept in human beds, sat in human chairs, listened while human words swarmed around me like angry bees. Mac had a wife back then. Helen was quick to laugh, but quick to anger too, especially when I broke something, which was often. Here is what I broke while I lived with Mac and Helen. One crib, 46 glasses, seven lamps, one couch, three shower curtains, three shower curtain rods, one blender, one TV, one radio, and three toes, my own. I broke the blender when I squeezed three tubes of toothpaste and a bottle of glue into it. I broke my toes attempting to swing from a lamp fixture on the ceiling. I broke 46 glasses, well, it turns out there were many ways to break a glass. Every weekend, Mac and Helen took me in their uh, convertible to a fast food restaurant where they ordered french fries and a strawberry shake. Mac loved to see the expression on the cashier's face when he drove up and said, Could I have some extra ketchup for my kid? I went to baseball games, to the grocery store, to a movie theater, even to the circus. They didn't have a gorilla. I rode a little motorbike and blew out candles on a birthday cake. My life as a human was a glamorous one, although my parents, traditional sorts, would not have approved. In my new life as a human, I was well tended. I ate lettuce leaves with Thousand Island dressing and caramel apples and popcorn with butter. My belly ballooned. But hunger, like food, comes in many shapes and colors. At night, lying alone in my poo pajamas, I felt hungry for the skilled touch of a grooming friend, for the cheerful grunts of a play fight, for the easy safety of my nearby troop foraging through shadows. Remember what happened to Tag, I told myself. Don't think about the jungle. Still, sometimes I lay awake wishing for the warmth of another just like me, asleep in the night nest of tender prayer plant leaves. I liked having sips of soda poured into my mouth like a bubbling waterfall, but every now and then I longed to search for a tender stalk of arrowroot to feel the tease of a mango, just out of reach. One day, Helen came home with something large and flat wrapped in brown paper. Look what I bought today, she said excitedly as she tore off the paper. A painting to go over the living room couch. Fruit in a bowl, Max said with a shrug. Big deal. This is fine art. It's called Still Life, Helen explained, and I think it's lovely. I dashed out to examine the painting, marveling at the colors and shapes. See, said Mac's wife, Ivan likes it. Ivan likes to roll up hoop and throw it at squirrels, Mac said. I couldn't take my eyes off the apples and bananas and grapes in the picture. They looked so real, so inviting, so edible. I reached out to touch a grape, and Helen slapped my hand. Bad boy, Ivan, don't touch. She jerked her thumb at Mac. Honey, Go get a hammer and a nail, would you? While Mac and Helen were busy in the living room, I wandered into the kitchen. A cake covered in thick chocolate frosting sat on the counter. I like cake. I love it, in fact. But it wasn't eating I was thinking about. It was painting. The frosting peaked and dipped like waves on a tiny pond. It looked rich and gooey, dark and smooth. It looked like mud. I scooped up a handful of frosting. I scooped up another. I headed to the refrigerator door. It was perfect, an empty, white, waiting canvas. The frosting wasn't as easy to work with as jungle mud. It was stickier, and of course, more tempting to eat. But I kept at it. I scraped off every last bit of that frosting. I may have eaten a little cake, too. I don't remember what I was trying to paint, a banana, most likely. I suppose I knew I was going to get in trouble. But at that moment, I just didn't care. 
I wanted to make something, anything, the way I used to. I wanted to be an artist again. I soon learned about humans. I soon learned that humans can screech even louder than monkeys. After that, I was never allowed in the kitchen. Back in those days, the big top mall was smaller. It had a pony ride, a wooden train that bustled around the parking lot, a few bedraggled parrots, and surly spider monkey. But even uh, but when Mac brought me a baby gorilla dressed in a crisp tuxedo to the mall, everything changed. People came from far and wide to see their picture to have their pictures taken with me. They brought me blocks and a toy guitar. They held me in their laps. Once I even held a baby in mine. I was small. She was small and slippery. Bubbles flowed from her lips. She squeezed my fingers. Her rear was puffy with padding. Her legs bowed like bent twigs. I made a face. She made a face. I grunted. She grunted. I was so afraid that she would fall that I had squeezed her tightly, and her mother yanked her away. I wonder if my mother ever worried about dropping us. We always held on, but that's easier to do when your mother is furry. Human babies are an ugly lot, but their eyes are like our baby's eyes. Too big for their faces and for the world.